Great. So welcome to this session, which is a sixth section of the SOS Empire Virtual Educational Channel. And we have the pleasure to be hosted today um, from Melbourne in Australia. We have 70 participants registered from 18 countries today, and I will uh, let Robert uh, start the meeting with a little introduction. Merci, Frédéric. Je peux y aller, je peux commencer? Je peux y aller. Well, OK. Opening this uh, sixth discussion on a clinical case on the ESO Stanford Senpai platform of excellence in esophagology, I have an extremely sad message to convey to you. Ah, never, never again will we see on the stages of Congress centers across the world the so recognizable profile of a giant of our profession, Donald O. Castell. All those who manage to be at his side in their careers or in their lives for just a few moments or during their entire professional path in the numerous societies that he presided over or in the so many congresses where he was president of honor. All those will remember Don and his overpowering presence, hidden perhaps behind his warm and winning smile. And he was an honorary member of our organization, Ozo, and he chaired session after session in the ESO Congresses throughout the decades. De. I like de, this picture taken at the time of the third ESO Congress in Paris that was in 1990. At the closing of this event, he returned to Charleston with this side in English and in French, you can see the French behind him, written by my mentor, Jean-Louis Lorta Jacob, and you can read, the esophagus indeed is a hypersensitive fellow. And he wanted to post this sign in his office in Charleston. Then during another Congress, this was in 2000, following a preliminary poll taken beforehand questioning all the members of Uzo and announced at the end of an unforgettable gala evening in year 2000 at the Royal Abbey of Chalice, among a group that you can see here of most of the greatest figures of ethnophagology. You can recognize John Richter, uh, Dick Sampliner, Henry Appelman, Rudiger Sievert, and many others here among this group. After quatre, a dazzling, a dazzling run off with his old friend Tom de Meester, you can see both of them there. Don Castell was at this time elected Pope of Esophagology, Saint Cis. You can see him on these two pictures. So happy he was there on these uh, two pictures. And not to speak of all the other events when Don reigned, set a wit, dressed in his red cape, of which he was so proud. Don Castell was an immense personality. Don the debater, Don the chairman, Don the lecturer, Don the world-renowned physician, Don who also knew to be on so many occasions at the center of festive celebrations. And Don Castell will remain for us all an immense source of light. Now in line with the multidisciplinary activities of ESO and the Stanford platform, we shall now open the sixth discussion of a clinical case. This time, the Pilot Center of Melbourne 
has organized this presentation and debate according to precise indications now well established. A case chosen for its particular educational value by Professor Matthew Reed, a surgeon active in his pilot center of Melbourne in all fields of esophagology. A young member of the team to present the case, this time Dr. Henry Badgeri, and a prestigious multidisciplinary panel. Among the members of this panel, together with uh, Hiroshi Mashimo, Rishan McCallum, and Dr. Chamara Basanayake, a gastroenterologist with a particular interest in functional gut pathologies, our friend Lee Swanstrom, a world-renowned surgeon and one of the pillars of FESO was to figure. Unfortunately, Lee cannot be present at the beginning of this session, and he may be perhaps able to join the discussion later on. But he will be replaced today by Dr. Kevin Revis, a surgeon from Portland. Uh, he is also familiar with our congresses, and uh, Kevin kindly accepted at the last minute to lend his expertise to the discussion. The case today has been particularly well chosen by Matthew Reed. I'm sure it will provoke debate and maybe controversy. A fine session is ahead of us, and I hand over to Matthew. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robert, for that introduction. Um, yeah, and thank you, Kevin, as well, for stepping in last minute. As Robert said, um, Lee is unavailable. Um, and well, welcome to Melbourne and St. Vincent's, and we hope you enjoy this case dis discussion. Um, I think we've chosen a case that's um, got a few twists and turns and hopefully ha has a lot of um, good discussion points. So as Robert said, Henry will be presenting the case. H Henry is our chief surgical resident at St. Vincent's, and he's also due to start his PhD with us next week as well. So. Um, he's a good person, I think, to uh, lead the case off. So, Henry, do you want to get underway? Absolutely. I just Thank want, you. I don't know if we've got Richard McCullum on board yet. He's he's one of the other discussants, so we might have to. Yeah, Richard, to one he will be a little late. Later. later. Is he? Okay. Thank you, Frederick. Well, thank you. So, thank you for the introduction, Matt. So I'll, I'll bring up the our slides. Um, So this is for this, the, uh, the sixth meeting, and this was an announcement I was asked to put up uh, from the New York Academy of Sciences. Um, the Esophagology Encyclopedia is free for the next week or so. So we thought we'd provide some um, background information on Melbourne and, and circumstances in which we, we work. Melbourne's a city of about 4.8 million people, the capital of Victoria, with a very diverse ethnic background. Um, residents from about 200 countries. St. Vincent's Hospital, where we work, um, is a major tertiary referral centre within Melbourne, just uh, abutting the central business district. Um, it's a university teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Melbourne and a centre of ex excellence in digestive diseases. Um, here's Melbourne here, the CBD in the middle, and then in this blue box is St. Vincent's Hospital. And another image of St. Vincent's Hospital where we are today. Um, in terms of uh, our esophagology units, we've got an upper GI unit, which is growing. It now has five uh, surgeons or consultants and a, and, a, and a large gastroenterology unit with about 15 gastroenterologists, four of which are interventional endoscopists, as well as an active research unit. We're talking about hiatus hernia repairs today, and I thought we'd put up some local data from our center. Um, over the last seven years, we've performed 468 um, hiatus hernia operations, the vast majority, 370 or 80% being fundal applications and hiatus hernia repairs combined. Um, of note, about 7.5% of the hiatus hernia surgery is revisional surgery, um, with not all of the primary surgery taking place at St. Vincent's um, a referral centre for revisional surgery. Um, below a, some you know, notable complication rates, readmissions about 2.6%, um, dysphagia 1.1%, postoperative nausea and vomiting 2.1%. And lastly, a, a few images for, for context. Um, on the left here, we've got a, a picture of Victoria in blue and France in red to get a sense of size. 
In the middle, there are two towns, Melbourne and Shepparton, Shepparton being a small country town where our patient is from. Uh, it's about a two hour drive, 190 kilometers or 118 miles. Um, so it's quite a, a big sort of geographical area that the, the hospital services. Um, and on the right, we've got Australia in this little bottom right hand corner is Victoria. Well, it's, a, it's a vast landscape. Our patient, um, June, for all intents and purposes, it's not her real name. She's a 67 year old lady uh, from Shepparton, which is a, a regional town in Victoria, as mentioned, about two hours north of Melbourne. Um, she's a reasonably fit and well lady. She's from home. She's got a supportive husband and two grown up children, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink alcohol, and otherwise reasonably well. Medical history is significant for breast cancer, uh, which she had breast conserving uh, surgery and chemotherapy and radiotherapy in 2018 with no evidence of recurrence. She's got hypertension and depression. Um, she's got a family history significant for breast and ovarian cancer. Uh, and she's on um, a number of medications, Somac or Pantoprazole, Citalopram, and an anti-hypertensive. Uh, now, in July 2019, uh, June had a laparoscopic paraesophageal hiatus hernia repair in, at Shepparton Hospital, um, which is, as mentioned, a small regional hospital. This procedure was performed by, by a general surgeon, not a specialist upper GI surgeon. Um, she had a posterior repair of the hiatus and an anterior 180 degree wrap. In the post-operative period, um, she developed some early symptoms suggestive of recurrence. She had some ongoing dysphagia. She never really tolerated a solid diet following this procedure. Um, she had sort of intermittent vague chest pain. Um, in April the following year, she presented to the emergency department with, with some chest pain and had a CT abdo pelvis, which um, demonstrated a recurrence. It's likely that she'd had this recurrence um, for some time following the procedure. Um, these are the... Yeah, you just want to stop there and go back uh, yep. a couple of times. I might just ask Kevin at this point, in the States, um, which surgeons are doing repairs of these large hiatus hernias? Do you have to be a specialist thoracic or foregut surgeon or a, is a general type surgeon doing these operations? Well, first off, uh, thank you to Dr. Reed and Dr. Julie for the invitation. I'm happy to uh, join you all and uh, delighted to provide my insight. Um, you know, in the United States, it really depends geographically. Um, in the uh, Portland, Oregon uh, metro uh, area here, uh, there is actually a fair concentration of esophageal specialists that perform the large majority of these type operations. Um, the further you get from, you know, a, a large urban setting, the more likely that a, a hernia repair like this may be done by a generalist. Um, that being said, there are some specialists who live in, in quite remote areas and are certainly capable of repairing these. Um, you know, the preference simply based on the fact that dealing with recurrences is uh, quite challenging is that um, if the index operation is done by a specialist, that's uh, you know certainly the preference that we have. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. It sounds very similar to the setup that we have in Australia, and I think we've got similar geographical sort of considerations. But um, so this operation was performed in the regional centre by a general a generalist, and I, I guess you know the the description of the repair. We don't have any images or videos or anything, but it's probably not. The sort of repair that we would be doing in the tertiary center and it, it's it seems like they've had an early recurrence and i guess at this point would you what would you do at, as a specialist kevin would you be investigating early or intervening early in someone with ongoing symptoms in the early post -op yeah case? yeah yeah i agree particularly for uh you know if, if they're severely symptomatic um you know the concern is that it's already you know quite large on that ct scan and, and most likely it's natural course if left untreated is it's going to continue to enlarge over the next you know several months or years and we may be dealing with an entirely intrathoracic stomach um if uh if left to progress um you know typical workup in a patient who presents with a recurrence um it's going to be what we also standardly do for patients with index um, large parasophageal hernias, including imaging. CT is helpful, but an upper GI um, swallow x-ray is also quite helpful. It's one to establish preoperative baseline to compare with their post-operative normalized anatomy and you know, future surveillance without having to get a CAT scan every time we want to assess their anatomy. Um, two is uh, upper endoscopy. And then uh, motility, um, is appropriate really depending on, on what we're assessing. If in the States, if we're going to do, or in our practice, if we're going to do a partial 
uh, fund application regardless. Um, utility is helpful, but not necessarily absolutely crucial. Um, but uh, certainly imaging and an upper endoscopy preoperatively would be where we would start. Yeah, thank you. And that, that would be the same for us. So do you want to continue, Henry? Sure. Um, so this was the CT I mentioned. So it was not repaired at this point once it's CT had taken place. Um, so this is our discussion earlier. Um, now, several months later, in about July of the same year, she presented to Shepparton Emergency Department um, with quite severe epigastric pain. She had a repeat CT scan that demonstrated um, progression of this higher dystonia with a mesenteroaxial volvulus. Um, Shepparton is a smaller hospital with limited access, limited theater access. At this point, it was quite late at night and it was not possible to, to take this lady for urgent endoscopy um, at, her, at her hospital. So she was transferred to St. Vincent Hospital for ongoing management. Um, the, the key issue here was the, the limited or delayed theater access in a regional hospital, which is an ongoing problem all around the world, I'm sure, but it's certainly a problem in Australia. Um, I thought we'd use this moment to do a brief summary slide on, on gastric volvula. So as I'm sure almost all of you are aware, it's a rotation of the stomach along either its long or short axis. So two, broadly speaking, two classifications, um, organoaxial, uh, where it rotates along the long axis, A, and mesenteroaxial, where it rotates around the short axis, B. Our Lady June has a mesenteroaxial um, a gastric volvulus. The risk factors are diaphragmatic abnormalities, obviously, um, it, it, advanced age, um, any phrenic nerve paralysis or other anatomical gastrointestinal abnormalities. Um, the treatment initially um, is resuscitation and urgent gastric decompression. Um, the danger of gastric volvulus, is, of course, is um, progressive ischemia of the stomach uh, and ultimately infarction. Um, if surgical, if decompression is unsuccessful, then surg surgical intervention is required, or if there's any evidence of perforation or septic shock. Um, in terms of surgical uh, intervention, the two options are hydrosonia repair versus gastro gastrectomy if required. Um, if decompression is possible, um, then the patient requires interval definitive treatment, um, which is what category most patients fall into. Um, and this takes the place of hiatus hernia repair and fund application or gastropexy. Yeah, so thanks. Henry. So, so I think the key point there is in the acute setting, the main thing is resuscitation and, and achieving that gastric decompression. Ideally, I prefer to, to do that endoscopically. I don't like the idea of passing a blind nasogastric tube. We've seen the too many iatrogenic injuries from nasogastric tubes. But I guess in this case, it really, I think one of the things that, you know, probably contributed to the patient's poor outcome was this delay to theatre. Um, any comments from any of the panelists? Yeah. I agree, uh, uh, Matt, in our practice, oftentimes we'll get a call from a referring hospital that a patient has presented and they've already placed the nasogastric tube. So um, fortunately, most of the time it's been done without injury. I agree with you, endoscopically direct visualization is uh, certainly ideal to get a good idea and also to guide the tube placement uh, as opposed to a blind placement. Um, and so, so far we've been, I say for the most part, fortunate that the referring hospitals have either uh, not placed it and then they come to us or they've placed it and not caused any injury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. And what, um, just while you're talking, Kevin, what do you quote somebody as the risk of a volvulus in the presence of a large hiatus hernia or parasophageal hernia? So, um, you know, looking back at the uh, you know, 2003 um, uh, study that we oftentimes look at in terms of natural progression um, out of the Massachusetts General Hospital, um, there was a, uh, using a Markovian analysis around, you know, up to maybe 4% risk per year of the development of a volvulus of an untreated, really large parasophageal hernia. Uh, so I, I simply tell folks, look, don't lose any sleep over it tonight. However, you know, the potential risk of this becoming an acute emergency, you know, is, uh, you know, several percentage points per year. So it's something to really consider taking care of because you don't want to have this become an acute emergency uh, when you're out in a remote location away from advanced care. Mm -hmm. Matt uh, Soroshi here. Uh, hey, Hiroshi. Okay. Welcome. Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight from a GI point of view was really the role of endoscopy and what I keep reiterating to my fellows 
is the importance of the retroflexed uh, um, view of the stomach with ample, very ample insufflation. And I can't under, uh, uh, overemphasize that because uh, we are in a very unique position when we do have the endoscope to truly distend the stomach as much as possible, which clearly uh, contrast imaging studies cannot do. And, uh, and by doing so, uh, I can't, you know, I, I have to emphasize that you can really bring out both sliding as well as perisophageal hernias uh, and their relationship to the diaphragm, and that can be very helpful. In this case, what I find interesting is that even postoperatively, the patient already had some dysphagia. And you know, that is worth looking or dissecting into what kind of dysphagia that is. And many times people confuse gastric symptoms also from um, esophageal symptoms. So those are kind of important in terms of seeing the timing of the dysphagia. You mentioned that wasn't, was tolerating actually soft liquids, but was having difficulty, I gather, with solids. So that's a little bit uh, atypical. And when we're thinking about um, esopho uh, e gastroesophageal junction um, outflow obstructions, then that actually is the role for a manometry uh, to look at the physiology, look at the uh, position of the high pressure zone, uh, see if that's compensated, uh, and where that high pressure zone is in relationship to the respiratory inversion point. Yeah. Can I just interlude? I entirely agree. <laughs> Endoscopy. Um, he achieves just beside the uh, 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 gross assessment of the gastric mucosa. Most importantly, nasogastric drainage would not achieve complete decompression. Endoscopy, you can maneuver into the distal chamber uh, of antropyloic chamber as well and try to decompress it and, and visualize the gastric mucosa. And also it, it uh, enables us to uh, uh, time the surgery. If there's a bit of a gastric mu mucosal edema is pre ischemia, X, Y, Z. So that's also is essential. So endoscopy is paramount uh, um, and also timeliness of it is also extremely important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Matthew. for those, those comments. Oh, we've got Nicole there, have we? Matthew, I was just looking, you know, the, the initial scan that Henry showed up at the first CT where there was suspicion of recurrence on imaging. It looked like already that the stomach was in a, not just a recurrence, the position of it looks like he was already looking, like he was going to start to evolve, just a position mm -hmm. where the duodenum is relative to the gastroesophageal junction. So I wonder, you know, at that first point, regardless of whether or not, you know, she had ongoing symptoms, that imaging finding itself is concerning. Mm -hmm. I think there's a comment from Dr. Stoddard as well. You can Please unmute can... yourself. I can hear you. Dr. Studdard, we can hear you. You can talk. Yeah, unfortunately, we cannot hear. Chris, we can't hear you. So maybe we can, oh yeah, if you can unmute yourself, that will work better. Can you hear me now? Much better, great. I do <laughs> apologize. Chris Studdard, surgeon in Sheffield, England. Could we just be very clear on what everyone is meaning by decompression? Yes, we can do an endoscopy and we can look down and insert a nasogastric tube to remove the air. How many of the panel would attempt to perform an endoscopic untwisting of the, uh, of the uh, gastric volvulus? Does, does any one of the panel have experience of this? Well, I, I can start this with Professor from uh, uh, T-side uh, UK. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. Sometimes, uh, uh, especially uh, those who are used to do these therapeutic endoscopies under screening, I do occasionally intentionally use screening. And with, without your knowledge, you uh, uh, you reduce and make a volvulus, uh, unvolvulus, uh, stomach. So absolutely right, you can try, but it, uh, in majority of the time, emergency situations, no, I have not tried it, but I certainly have um, you know, assess the stomach. And most important, in my opinion, is trying to negotiate the endoscope into the distal chamber, which is like a dumbbell stomach, mm -hmm. which is twisted either way, mm -hmm. and then decompress it. So uh, I think it's, 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 it's a good point to, to, uh, uh, to discuss. I, th this would be my approach. I would try, try to decompress the stomach endoscopically, but I wouldn't try to uh, rotate it. I have looked at the world literature 
and there are isolated case reports and a number of case reports of, of people talking about derotation of the volvulus. But I think the most important thing is, is with the endoscopy is assessment of the perfusion of the gastric mucosa and its relative ischemia, because this is this will be one of the main determinants of outcome um, of the uh, of the volvulus. I, I would I imagine from um, no one else has replied. Does that mean that few of the other uh, participants in the meeting tonight have ever attempted to perform a derotation of a gastric volvulus endoscopically, creating an A loop, an alpha loop within the stomach, and then advancing the scope and, and trying to untwist it? Uh, this Chris, is Hiroshi. Okay. Hiroshi, you speak. Okay, yeah, this is Hiroshi from Boston. Um, yes, we've actually been asked often uh, to do just that. And I've also been in situations where um, just serendipitously we find such volvuli and uh, as mentioned by the other panelists that that uh, that retroflexed view that you have to get to get to the mm -hmm. pylorus is certainly quite telling and mm -hmm. it is possible to use you know the retroflexion to straighten that out uh, the reason why I'm not very eager to do this as the primary way although as you mentioned the acute issue here is to rule out ischemia is the very causes, the anatomic causes that are causing the rotation uh, is very likely to recur just as, when, just as with colonic volvulus. So uh, I only see that as a very short temporizing measure and not the actual treatment. Thank you. And to dovetail Dr. Mishima's comments, um, good. Oh, um, as I say, to dovetail Dr. Mishima's comments, the idea here is, um, basically to bridge the patient safely to the operating room. And if they're in, they're, in, they're in danger, get in, decompress, stomach looks safe, get to the operating room, we can take care of the rest there. Yeah. And sorry, I, I agree with all those comments. Thank you, everybody. And in this setting, in the first instance, we took them to, we got them down to Melbourne, took them to theater for an endoscopy and we actually don't have the video, but I was actually able to, on that retroflex view, to get through the pylorus into the duodenum. And I left a single uh, nasogastric tube that was passed under vision in the proximal stomach. So that was at the first setting. And we do have a video from a subsequent endoscopy, which we will show. But yeah, my, my, the purpose for the endoscopy for me is to assess the, the stomach, to see if there's any ischemia or edema and work out the timing of surgery. Ideally, yeah. we decompress and come back in about four or five days time, sort of a, a, an early sort of semi-elective procedure. That's our standard practice. So Henry, do you want to continue? Cool. So for a few, she had a repeat CT um, in the country, uh, which shows considerable progression of a hernia. Um, on, on this occasion, she had oral contrast, um, which made it into the stomach, but not, not beyond the stomach. Um, I'll show you the coronals. Um, so as you can see, the, the, the proximal stomach is sort of sitting within the abdomen, but then the, the distal stomach is herniated back up into the, into the chest. Um, and there's no oral contrast getting into this, into this segment and it's evolved in the mesentero-axial fashion. Um, so this prompted fairly um, urgent transfer to Melbourne for um, endoscopy. So as Matt mentioned, um, she had a an endosco endoscopic insertion of a nasogastric tube and effective decompression of the stomach, um, but not a devolving. The, she had a viable stomach, no mucosal defects, and the endoscope passed relatively easily uh, into the proximal stomach. Um, the herniated distal stomach was visualized and entered. Um, she had quite a, um, a good symptomatic improvement following this procedure. Th this was done overnight, and in the morning, uh, she looked pretty good. She didn't have much in the way of nausea, and her pain had certainly settled. Um, well, we sort of we discussed this point, really, the techniques to reduce gastric volvulus, unless anyone else has anything else to add. Um, I think just, just one point there, Henry. Um, yeah. The, I think somebody made a comment about how many tubes you need to decompress. And I think we had this debate, I think Michael, he's online at the moment, another the head upper GI surgeon from our unit. I left one tube in and uh, some people have said they leave two tubes in proximal and distal stomach. 
Um, is there a general consensus as to where you should leave a tube in the vulva stomach? Maybe Christopher might have a comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we would just put a, a tube down. I usually use, if I have this situation, I usually just use one tube into the stomach. Mm -hmm. and ju just to keep it decompressed. As you say, the important thing is to decompress the stomach with a view to repairing it surgically as soon as seems appropriate, given the how the patient has been resuscitated. One more subtlety. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah, so one more subtlety is that during the endoscopy, when this is reducible or as you're looking for ischemic uh, territory, uh, it's very important to, uh, just as important, not just to look at the cardio retroflex view, but to look at the pylorus and the antrum. Mm -hmm. And one of the features that I look for there is, is the pylorus slammed shut or is it very patent? Uh, and are there antral or incisural waves? And those are kind of speaking of the potential of vagal injury uh, and uh, your next steps in terms of thinking about uh, gastric emptying problems, which may guide me in terms of saying whether there's a decompression needed just to mm -hmm. Dr. He, you wanted to intervene? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matt, for the presentation so far. I'm uh, enjoying it. Just a couple of comments. Um, I think it's also just important to remember the clinical context. We've had a couple of situations where a nasogastric has been placed and it's actually been placed through the torted stomach into the duodenum and, and therefore hasn't actually decompressed the torsion. So whilst radiologically it may have given the appearance of a well-placed nasogastric, it didn't actually fix the problem. So it's important in that situation, obviously, to uh, do a rather prompt operation rather than waiting the time you would prefer to wait. And the second thing, I, no, no one really mentioned, I'm sure it's uh, sort of fairly well known, but a badly performed endoscopy is also a problem in this, in this situation. We've had the situation where an endoscope has actually insufflated the torted part, but not been able to access the torted part and therefore has made the problem worse. So again, I think it's really important to remember the clinical context. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. They're good points there. Um, so Henry, do you want to move on? Yeah. Now. This next slide, to be clear, is not our patient, um, but this is another case, um, similar story. It came from the country, um, delayed Actually, access. I'll, I'll talk the, about this slide, Henry. This, oh, yeah, so okay. This is an identical presentation from the same hospital, a patient with a volvulus, and this is an actual video that I do have from my endoscopy. But this is just the... I put this down just to illustrate the purpose of doing the endoscopy in this setting, and this was to assess the mucosa endoscopically, and clearly it was necrotic, and we proceeded straight to a gastrectomy in this setting. So do you want to play the video? But yeah, just to point out, this is not this patient. But... So that, that's just in case you haven't seen a dead stomach endoscopically, that's what it looks like. All right, next slide, Henry. So that sort of day one post the scope on the PM ward round, she was starting to um, develop recurrence of symptoms. She, she was getting um, worsening epigastric pain that had really resolved that morning. So it was coming back and chest pain as well. Um, some epigastric tenderness. She was quite nauseated and generally looked unwell from the end of the bed. Um, the decision was made to return to theatre for a, a repeat endoscopy. She had the nasogastric in situ at this point, um, bear in mind, but decision to return to theatre for an urgent endoscopy, um, plus minus proceed to, to theatre for uh, definitive surgery. Um, we do have a, a video from this um, gastroscopy, um, which I'll play now. Well, Hiroshi, this, this might be one for Hiroshi to look at and comment on. So bearing in mind, this is the second endoscopy. There's already a nasogastric in situ. And I think the nasogastric has come back more towards the OG junction. Oh, did you get more, Henry? You've cut out, Matt. Oh, sorry. If you didn't hear me, so th this is the second endoscopy. The nasogastric is in situ, and I think it's come back. It's just sitting at the OG junction, but we're just gaining access to the stomach. And I think in a second, I managed to get that retroflex view 
And you can see how twisted it is and where you have to go to sort of enter the distal chamber of the stomach. So maybe is Hiroshi there? Can he see this video? Oh, absolutely, great. And I have it on my ancillary screen. So I'm seeing it very wonderfully. And this I'll is exactly the kind of view that we see is an extreme retroflex view to see where the pylorus is or the rest of the stomach is. Uh, sure. That's very telling. And, um, and one of the, uh, to address uh, one of the comments about a badly done EDD. Henry, can you just pause it at that retroflex view midway yeah. through the video? Yeah, you had a really nice view there and that's uh, very difficult to get yeah. into. A little bit and... more, a little bit more. Yeah, there, yes. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. That a bit. Yeah, and uh, it looks a little purple down there, but um, so, um, so this is clearly a patient who's probably been on long-term PPIs with a lot of hyperplastic polyps uh, or fundic polyps uh, as well. And uh, what makes this very difficult is that as you sit there with putting too much air, it makes the process even more difficult. Uh, one of the things I wanted to address from the comments about a badly done EGD, uh, uh, and this can also occur for a badly done colonoscopy as you're asked to reduce a uh, colonic volvulus, uh, always remember that you can take the biopsy channel cap off. And when you do that, then despite your, uh, your you know, uh, common uh, you know, tendency to sit on the air um, button, uh, by taking the biopsy channel uh, uh, cap off, you automatically decompress. So that's a little bit of a you know, suggestion maybe for making sure that you don't overinflate. And when you're trying to attempt to uh, get in there for passage of a guide wire, as you're about to decompress and you know, put a nasogastric tube over that wire, uh, what you really want to do is make sure that stomach is very decompressed because as you're lying into the larger uh, stomach, you're going to start coiling more than advancing. So just some comments there. So, Hiroshi, in this setting, how hard would you try to go into the distal stomach and assess the pylorus? Because this is quite difficult. You're in a fully retrosplex view, both wheels at full turn. You have to pull back quite a lot even to approach the pylorus. Yeah. I mean, do you test at this point and, and stop here or do you try and do more? Uh, well, generally, and I don't mean to, you know, to, but if you decompress the stomach in most cases, and I've only seen maybe about 10 or you know, maybe a dozen, uh, that uh, I am able to get in. And I think that's important because if you're thinking about, you know, looking at the assessment of the pylorus as well uh, and may miss further ischemia, uh, I think that you know, the attempt to go in there is good. And I don't see the danger unless you were in a huge field of ischemia like you, saw, you just showed me uh, with necrosis or even you know, uh, uh, liquefaction, those would be very dangerous. But uh, it, otherwise in a mucosa like this, I think it's very important to look uh, distally uh, because I, have, I would have at hand a uh, guide wire uh, to be ready to put that in. Mm -hmm. And I've just received message that Richard McCullum, one of our other panelists has just logged in as well. So Richard will be very useful for the later discussions of this case. So welcome Richard. And if you could turn your video on, that would be good as well. So we can all see you. All right. Hello Carry Richard. On. So next slide, Henry. Following the gastroscopy, she proceeded to have a uh, repair, definitive repair of a hyodysonia, or a recurrent hyodysonia. So the gastroscopy, as demonstrated, she had a viable stomach. Um, she had a laparoscopic repair. About 80% of the stomach was intrathoracic, um, certainly from a laparoscopic view. Um, we have footage of the, the procedure, but essentially she had about a 270-degree two, floppy fund duplication and a cruel repair um, following reduction of the herneal sac. Um, she had a repeat gastroscopy on completion of the case. There were no mucosal defects, no air leaks. Um, she returned to the ward on clear fluids and antiemetics um, and, and did quite well. So I'll you bring up... that... yeah. yeah, I will share that now. So I've put, I've put together a video from this operation. It was, it was a long operation. It was about two, two and a half hours, but I've cut it down just a few of the key points in, in sort of, I think it goes about 10 or 11 minutes, but um, it's in real time. I haven't sped it up or anything. So firstly, just pause there. Yep. So for this operation, I, I perform this in the lithotomy position. So I'm standing between the legs and patients in a reverse Trendelenburg position. 
I tend to perform an optical entry and this is my port setup. So these are all five millimeter ports, the camera ports as indicated, and the right, my right hand port is an eight millimeter port. I have an assistant sitting down uh, on the patient's left side and they've got an assistant port and we've got a fixed body wall liver retractor that we use the Nathanson liver retractor in that top epigastric port. So that's my standard port configuration for sort of pretty much all my hiatal sort of surgery. And Kevin and Nicole, is that sort of similar setups that you would use? Mine's uh, fairly similar. Uh, the uh, I actually have patients in uh, supine position operating from the right. So my hand, my right hand is where your camera port is, and my camera is where your eight millimeter uh, port is. However, um, each of my three partners, we each operate slightly different, and that configuration is identical to at least one or two of my partners. And uh, each setup seems to work just fine. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you're right there, like you can do it a number of different ways and it's just whatever you're comfortable with in terms of the ergonomics of the operation and getting access and exposure to the correct anatomy. So yep. play Henry. And can you just move that box out of the way as well? This one. Yeah. Tough. So if, just pause along the way as well. So. This is the initial phase of the operation. I'm just, this is just reducing that, that volved stomach. And as you can see, it was that distal stomach that was volved anteriorly. Um, and I, I don't know if everyone, every surgeon would do this, but I like to reduce the contents. Just it gives me a better view of that hiatus. And I'm sort of, I'm not dissecting on all the, on the structures that are within the sac. And I actually put a stay, that's putting a stay stitch in that we pull out of a port, full length suture just to keep everything retracted to give me that view and that exposure. So I don't know if that's a technique that you would do or do you just leave the contents in the, in the sack itself, Kevin? For primary, we try to perform either minimal or no touch technique by grasping the sack, or reducing the sack, but in a recurrence, assuming that the initial operation involved sack dissection and resection, I believe that was stated, there's no true sack now, it's a pseudo stack. And so reduction of the contents as you demonstrated is most likely going to need to be done, just like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I just comment there that um, I, I completely agree. However, when the recurrents do come through from other hospitals, sometimes the sack you find hasn't actually been taken down and that the true sack still exists, which is actually a nice surprise when you do see that. And, and, and that is the case that we're about to find out, that the, the sacs still exist. <laughs> there are some sutures anteriorly, but... So the, the first part of my operation involves sort of doing this incision around the hiatus. And I, I like to use diathermy hook for this, and it helps me just get into the correct plane. And it is a very thin layer that you're trying to sort of stay outside of this, this, this sac. And I've already put a couple of holes in it there, as you can see. But... Um, once I'm in that layer, then I'll do a bit of blunt dissection to, to bring that sack down. And I've got my assistant also grasping the sack and, and sort of triangulating and stretching things out in, in to sort of help me gain that exposure. I don't know, can you all see that video? It's a bit stuttery for me. I, I think the connection might be a bit slow. We can see it, it is very yeah, stuttery. The, the views are excellent. I paused oh, it a few times. That was probably the study. So just pause there for a second, Henry. So you can see here I've got the diathermy hook and I'm going through an actual V-lock suture. And so the plane is not an exact virginal plane. You know, that there is scar tissue and sutures there. And this turns out to be a V-lock suture. And if you recall from the original operation report, this V-lock was only placed on the posterior crust. So I'm not sure what it's doing in this position, but perhaps the um, advertised operation didn't really happen because there's a sack and there's sutures in the wrong spot and I don't really see a fundiplication either. So no. I, I guess with, with, I think the key in revisional surgery is just to try and slowly work away and restore the normal anatomy. And, uh, and uh, that's my main principle. And just, if you go back a little bit, I just want to, for the non-surgeons, just point out what we're doing. I think there was a bit of there's evidence there of some pleura from the from the left chest that were just sweeping away from the sac, and quite often that is the case. That I think a bit before that, yeah. 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 Maybe. 
So keep going. So it goes for a few minutes, but keep keep playing. Yes. I think the plural was in there somewhere. Was it? Just jump to the next section. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Matthew. So Matthew, one of the things. Oh, sorry, Christopher. But one of the things you, you you haven't said, it can be very difficult to identify the vague eye, can't it, with these redo operations? Often there's a lot of scar tissue there, and, and finding the vague eye can be difficult. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think I, I called Michael in at some point during this operation because I was getting a little bit lost. And as, I think for these revisional surgeries, it's it's always, I think it's good to have a second surgeon there. I don't think it's a, a failure per se. I think it's good to get a second opinion because as a surgeon, you, you, you can veer off course as well. So, you know, you, in your mind's eye, you, you, you sort of determine where everything is, but sometimes you can be off. And um, uh, I agree entirely. Um, I've been doing hiatal hernia surgery for a long time. Um, in fact, just as, as we're looking at the video, I was taught how to do this by someone who you will know very well, and that is David Watson from uh, Adelaide. Um, David was Glyn James's um, registrar, senior registrar at the time, and he came across to Sheffield for a year um, to work in my unit. And it was actually David had done 50, was in, had been involved in 50 uh, laparoscopic fundoplications when he came to Sheffield. And uh, it was David who taught me how to do it. And I, despite having done it for over 20 years, I agree entirely with you. It is often very difficult to, to, to see the, the natural anatomy in these redo operations. And I think it's very useful to have another experienced laparoscopic surgeon working with you in these um, redo operations. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we know David very well. He's our guru of hiatal and thunderplication. Absolutely. And I, I've just sort of highlighted where I think the vagus nerve is running in this situation. Yeah. So yeah. for the non-surgeons, you know, it, it, you know, in these revisional cases, it can be quite hard to see, but here you can sort of see a structure being tented up. And uh, yeah. part, a lot of this surgery, you know, the aim of it is to get that geojunction down below, below the diaphragm. And there's a lot of adhesions in the mediastine that you have to mobilize to divide, to sort of get that mobility. This is coming now down onto the left crust to get posteriorly. Um, in a second, we, um, we dissect posteriorly to the esophagus and I use this sling technique. So we pass a sling behind the esophagus and that, that, give, that with the assistance sort of slinging that up, that gives some nice retraction and exposure. Absolutely. And, and I sort of breathe a sigh of relief when I get a sling around it because I think the hard bit of the operation is almost done. So. So this is some dissection just in front of the aorta here yeah. on, on, on sort of the left side of the esophagus. And it's just really creating a landing spot for the graspers to then come through from the other side, coming under the esophagus. So we actually sling the esophagus in the mediastinum and then put some sort of six o'clock sort of retraction on it by the assistant to bring that down. So this, this is, you know, the process about just creating bluntly sort of dissecting, creating a window. You don't want to poke anything, put any any sharp instrument into any structure, but and then sort of change this is a 30 degree scope as well. So we're changing the angle of the light lead to give that view all the time. And I we just pass a Penrose drain in and uh, pull that through and, and pull that around and sling the esophagus. Do you do a similar technique, Kevin, or any any differences that you you do? A similar, um, you know, mobilization and uh, uh, absolutely, I use a Penrose um, every time, particularly because uh, I'm not always operating with an expert uh, assistant. Sometimes I'm working with a uh, you know, junior level resident or a, a nurse and. Uh, I find they're much more confident in grasping something as innocuous as a Penrose drained or a tract as opposed to asking them to grasp something like an esophagus or a stomach. So I find it's a great tool for uh, uh, visualization. Mm -hmm.
And once you have that sling in place, it makes it a lot easier to do this posterior sort of dissection. And there is always a, a posterior sac. And in this case, we're just incising that sac, but sometimes there can be a big sort of lipoma even or the posterior component that you need to reduce. Um, and then we keep dissecting until we see that pillar of the left crust there. So. Matthew, one thing that I find useful, we, we use an instrument which I, we call an endoflex. I don't know if you have them in Australia. It's an instrument which, uh, like a grasping instrument, but as you squeeze the handles, the tip flexes up to 90 degrees. And you can place that down behind the esophagus, squeeze the handle, the tip flexes, and that will often get round the esophagus, um, I find, more easily than a straight grasping forcep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've used those in the days when we used to put bands in. It was like a reticulating grasper that would pass behind the geo. Yes, that's right. Yeah. We, we call it as gold finger, uh, which is again... Yeah, yeah, uh, got the gold uh, finger. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's similar, similar uh, functions. But it does the same thing. It, you get round the esophagus and then you can pass your sling, which, as you say, Matthew, I think is very important. Because look at the view that you're getting on that, uh, on that image there perfect view because the esophagus has been lifted upwards and forwards. Yeah, exactly. And, and just pause uh, it there. Philip, Philip Mitchell from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, my only comment is um, we use the uh, Kasheri dissector or Kasheri grasper, which I find is very useful. You can just lay it against that left pillar and then you rotate your hand and it comes out the other side without going through the pleura. And, I use a feeding tube rather than a penrose. I just find it's uh, it's less obstructive. Okay. What was the name of that first instrument you just said, Philip? It's a Kasheri. It's a Kasheri grasper. Uh, Alf Kasheri and uh, Les Nathanson developed it. I uh, was in Adelaide with Glenn Jameson right around the same time as David, and uh, and we purchased it. You have to use a um, flexible trocar to, to, to use it, but I've been using it for years and years and it's an excellent instrument. Okay, I'll look into that. So at this point, you know, we're, we've reduced the, um, pause Henry. So we've restored the anatomy, the geo junctions below the, the diaphragm. And I guess at this point, you need to make some sort of decision about how you're going to close the hiatus. And a lot of that comes down to, I guess, how big the defect is and the quality of the tissues. You can see in this instance, given that it's a redo and maybe just some poor dissecting on my behalf, but I've, I've shredded some of the fascia from, the, from that right pillar. Um, so it, given that sort of um, image, you know, the surgeons on the forum, how would you, would you just do a primary repair of that? Would you use a pledge it? I think I, I, I use some little felt squares. Would you mesh it? Any comments here? Uh, I, I would primarily close this and uh, put a, a, a biosynthetic uh, a mesh on it. If I don't have access to the mesh, then certainly I'll, I'll close. And the left crura looks quite mature than the right, which is more attenuated. Maybe a bit of release incision on PTFP pledge it if I don't have access to mesh. Uh, so certainly it requires be uh, something in addition to primary repair, given looking at the, the picture and the quality of the tissues. Mm -hmm. Looking Thank at you. that, uh, Chris Stoddard again, Matthew, looking at that, one wonders how much dissection of the crora was performed by the surgeon at the original operation. Um, yes, yeah. there's a little bit of threading of the, uh, the, the muscle on the right side there, but the other pillar of the crust doesn't look to have been operated on at all, does it? It looks very, it looks very robust. It looks yeah. to be good muscle tissue. I'm not sure how much dissection occurred with that crust at the previous operation. And looking at that, to me, it looks as if it will hold sutures very well. If it doesn't use sutures, then like Mr. Vishwanath, I would, I would put, a, or like yourself, I would just put a, a little bit of a, a biosynthetic graft over the top just to, uh, just to suture it in position, just to reinforce it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it is, is a, I use this felt sort of pledge it just little centimeter squares, uh, yes. but essentially it's a primary suture repair. Uh, and I've used OSE bond suture here. I know 
every surgeon probably uses a different suture, but um, I, I like that suture. But... So somebody else was about to make a comment. Oh, I was just going to echo the comment. This is Kevin Revis. Echo the comment regarding um, we use uh, an imbricated uh, biosynthetic mesh. We typically close with uh, hiatal, uh, sorry, with uh, horizontal mattress sutures uh, through a piece of absorbable synthetic mesh to really incorporate it well. There's always a fear going in as a second time that we need to do something different than was done the first time. I agree, the, the, particularly the left truce looks um, pristine. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of a pleasant surprise, but uh, typically, yeah, to prevent um, further concerns in the future, an absorbable synthetic mesh is our typical practice. Yeah, and I agree with those comments. That that left pillar is pristine, and there was no, I didn't encounter any sutures posteriorly. All the sutures were anterior. So whether <laughs> yeah. he's just done an anterior repair with that V-lock, that was the only yeah. time that I encountered um, sutures. So... Maybe that's another point that these these should be done by a, a subspecialist surgeon. <laughs> Matthew Nicole Winter here. When you did your posterior dissection, did you look for or find the posterior vagus? Uh, looked for. I don't think I found it from memory. I couldn't. I may have edited out of this video, but certainly we saw the anterior. And if, if you do see the posterior vagus, what do you do with it? Where do you put that in terms of your sling and your repair? Nicole? I think in a true revision, uh, the point is sometimes you can't find it. And mostly depending on the type of repair that was done in the first instance, it is a posterior that's difficult to find. And if I do find it uh, in, a, in a primary, I try and put a posterior. So the wrap goes between the esophagus and the vagi. So that and can you when I go back to my, yeah. yeah, sorry, keep talking, Nicole. So when I go back to my own revision, I know that the Vegas is not there when I'm taking down the wrap. If I do have my own revisions, which I'm sure I will, but in this case, I, I don't. I'd be very surprised if you do find it. And if you do, I put it where it wants to sit because there already be lots of scar tissue around, mm -hmm. and tailor my repair around it. And we just missed that, but I was just trying to highlight. You know, you need to take good bites of that muscle. And I always, I'm always wary of the back end of the needle as well. You're passing that behind the esophagus. Always keep that under vision. You don't want to cause an injury with the back end of the needle. So. I find the posterior vagus is usually closely opposed to the esophagus. And so I tend to leave it with the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I tend to do that. I, I have seen people that sort of try and put it through the pillar repair, though. Um. I always try and leave the posterior vagus closely applied to the esophagus and put my sling behind posterior vagus so that the posterior vagus is still lying alongside the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I, I think we probably get a lot more injuries than we think we get because based on the uh, effect we have on the gastroparesis and or diarrhea and all that sort of stuff that, that these people who have recurrent parasophageal hiatus hernia repairs often come back with. Yeah. Now, when you're doing these cases, how do you gauge the size of the, the hiatus following your closure? How do you know when you've gone enough? Is it just, are you eyeballing it, seeing it when it's just snug against the esophagus? Or do you place a bougie down at this point? I don't what put a bougie, I don't put a bougie down. I've had uh, a couple that the uh, anesthetist has put right through the esophagus before, so I don't bother with that. Um, it's really just a visualization, um, moving the hiatus around, moving the esophagus around and trying to determine what you think is appropriate. And it's always a tightrope. So that's what we've done in this situation. But does anyone do anything differently? Yes, I always put a 54 French mercury weighted bougie down the esophagus with the, both the primary and the redo for the applications. And we have always done that uh, in Sheffield. Mm -hmm. 
Do you find so for hiatal closure, we close without the bougie. Oh, sorry. I I see, for hiatal closure, we close without the bougie. For the fund duplication, we typically uh, calibrate a complete fund duplication over a 56 or 60 French bougie. Mm. I guess the, the only trouble I've had was um, I had early in my training, I had a very early recurrence, and it was when I closed the hiatus just visually against the esophagus, but I didn't appreciate it was just a, a mega esophagus, it was just massively dilated. And basically, I think it created a potential space. It was still a big hiatal opening. So even though visually I closed against the esophagus, there was still a big space there. So I think in a case, if there's a really dilated esophagus, I think I might use a bougie in future. And then there's the question of the fund application and probably everyone in this audience does a different degree, 360, 270, 240, 180, 90, anterior, posterior, but um, I think the key thing is in this operation, I think the, the main principle of the operation is just to reduce that hernia, repair the defect. We're not really doing it an anti-reflux operation per se. Um, it's more the obstructive symptoms in the volvulus that we're operating on. So I think the key is to repair the, um, the hiatus correctly. And some, so I think some surgeons think that this sort of buttresses the repair. Maybe it does. Um, any comments there about types of fund application or need for fund application? We, uh, we've been doing a lot of anterior door fund applications. Um, mm -hmm. Probably got an experience of over 500 of them. And uh, we find it's, it's excellent because um, there's not so many recurrences as there are when you put it posteriorly right against your repair. Um, and it's I'm less disfading. Yeah, sorry, keep going, Philip. And, and it's less dysphagic. The other thing I would comment on is our threshold for doing a, a fundectomy uh, as a method of esophageal lengthening is very, very low. So uh, the, more of, uh, the more of these that you see, the more uh, esophageal lengthenings you, you do. So w when would you do that? Only if there's a, if the geojunction sitting above the, the, the hiatus or in this if case, would you consider it? If it's not really, really comfortably below the diaphragm, um, and, and I do that assessment after I've repaired the, the diaphragm posteriorly, and then I evaluate and decide uh, if, if I think it's appropriate to do a fundectomy, and my threshold has gotten lower and lower with time. Mm -hmm. And can you describe that technique? Because a lot of the junior surgeons wouldn't be familiar with that. They wouldn't have done it. But and, in, Are in you that stapler down your epigastric port, or what we're doing is uh, we pass uh, the bougie down, uh, probably a 50 54, pass it down, and then uh, we use a, an endo GIA stapler uh, with a 45 degree purple staples, and we're able to come transversely across probably two three centimeters below the gastroesophageal junction from the, from the greater, from where the short gastrics have been taken down right over to the bougie and then staple up and remove that piece of stomach. Okay. So, so your Can first firing is coming laterally from that short gastric territory. Yeah. And then what, what I like to do is I'll, I'll do the first stitch right at the crotch of where the staple lines meet. And then I retract that down and I complete the, the left-hand side or screen right uh, of the um, anterior door by approximating the staple lines all the way up to where it joins the um, greater curve. And then I roll the fundus of the stomach over and suture it down to the diaphragm to the right of the esophagus or GE junction. Okay, thank you. I just got you to pause the video there. We missed a step, but we put in this phrenoesophageal suture as well. So just to, re, to reconstitute that ligament. And, uh, and this is just the other side of the wrap. So we did this floppy, it was probably turned out to be about a 240 degree wrap, but, um, and I, I left the sack on. Does, do, do most people do that? Or do you try and dissect the sack out? Does that cause more vagal injury if you try and dissect the sack? Uh, yeah, yeah. From the point of sight, I mean, sorry. I would at least excise part of the sac just to get a bit of access, when, especially when you're suturing. 
I agree. Mm. I think uh, a skeletonization of esophagastric junction by outright uh, excision of the sac probably would uh, enhance bleeding, oozing, plus unintentional vagal neuropraxia or, or, or injury. So I entirely agree. Like Phil says, I usually do door fund application just uh, for especially trainees. If the recurrence happens, even after another recurrence, usually between 12 o'clock and three o'clock and door uh, while uh, uh, carrying it out, you cover 12 and three o'clock from left to right across the gastroesophageal junction with uh, 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 the suturing between the fundus and the diaphragm. So you're protecting or, or sort of decreasing that sort of a common site for future recurrence. So I think there are a lot of pluses uh, uh, doing door, but obviously I'm not, again, I have done posterior partial fund applications as well, but not often. I would, I would oh, sorry, can I just comment on the sac excision? Yeah. In yeah. the primary situation, I always remove the sac, and I think that's important. I find the best way or trick to doing that is to elevate the sac anteriorly and yes. divide it right down the middle down to the gastroesophageal junction, and you can sort of see the vagus that way, and then excise the left-hand side first, and then excise the right hand the right hand side but staying a little bit further away from the gastroesophageal junction while doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with philip there i think that is the best way to excise the sap in terms of the extent of the fund application um, i was clinical fellow at master medical center in canada in hamilton um, many years ago and worked with a chap called jim lind who Canadian surgeon who did a 270 degree fundoplication. And that was always my operation in the pre laparoscopic era. Since then, we have, um, we've done various types of fundoplication and um, various clinical trials comparing a total with a partial fundoplication and also anterior and posterior. Um, and the, the 270 degree partial fundoplication gives very good results. In terms of reflux control, it's as good as a, a Nissen fundoplication. Um, and I know there are many variations of that, um, but it doesn't seem to have quite as much early post-operative dysphagia as a, a complete fundoplication does. All right, next slide, Henry. I think that's it for the video. Um, so, post-op, she had a, a pretty uneventful recovery. She had a gradual dietary upgrade on clear fluids and um, antiemetics initially, but by day four post-op, she was well enough to go home. Uh, she was tolerating a pureed diet, um, which was requiring very little in the way of antiemetics uh, and little in the way of pain relief. Uh, she went back to Shepparton, um, but the case doesn't end there. Over the ensuing few weeks, she had multiple presentations to Shepparton Emergency Department with um, profound treatment-resistant nausea that was uh, quite persistent. Um, she'd had uh, several investigations, um, but they never really got to the bottom of what the, what the root cause was. She had a barium swallow done, which demonstrated a fairly normal passage of contrast into the, into the stomach. There are some stills from the swallow on the right. Um, she even had an MRI brain that, that looked for a central cause of her nausea, um, which was completely normal. Um, she had another repeat CT abdo pelvis. Um, this was three weeks after, and that demonstrated a, a structurally intact repair um, and no evidence of recurrence of the hernia. Um, Can you stop there, Henry? Yeah. Maybe we'll invite Richard to talk now. Um, are you still there, Richard? Yeah, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's good to hear an Aussie accent. Yeah, it's a bit diluted out. Listen, I might ask you a favor. I have uh, with me my colleague, Dr. Brian Davis, who does all my surgeries, gastric stimulators, polaroplasties, and esophageal. And uh, maybe Dr. Davis might, even though he wasn't part of the core curriculum faculty, as a favor to me, I guess, and as a good way of spreading goodwill here at my university, uh, I would appreciate your indulgence uh, if, if Dr. Davis might make a couple of comments about uh, some of the pictures he saw and, and, oh. and the initial part of this problem. Would you mind? No, more than welcome. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you. I'd have to agree with Dr. Stoddard that the Nissen 
has been the historic gold standard, but in America, we're finding out the American Forget Society is more and more people are moving to the toupee because that's how the Lynx magnetic strength or augmentation took off. The complaints of dysphagia, gas bloat, and uh, post-operative problems really has put the, dis the, the Nissen on the way out. And also with the toupee, you're not risking damage to the vagus nearly as often and result in gastroparesis. This is, this is an anterior? Well, the, the toupee, Richard, is the posterior. Yeah. The key with the toupee is not only are you suturing to the 11 o'clock and one o'clock positions for 270 wrap, you're also placing anchor sutures through the crura so that the posterior wrap does not move up and down on the esophagus because that can cause problems as well. Yeah, yeah, that sounds, sounds like the same thing we do here. Yeah. But I guess, Richard, yeah. in this situation, yeah. uh, a patient with recurrent hiatus hernia, gastric volvulus, she's a month post-op, persistent nausea, you know, she's presenting to this regional center. I mean, you know the geography in Australia quite well, but um, sure. probably just not, they're not recognizing what's going on. They're, they're doing a number of tests and, and they're, not, they're basically dismissing her from the emergency department. So she's getting quite frustrated. How, how would you manage this patient in this setting? Like what, what workup would you be doing? Well, the barium swallow, you said, did confirm that things tended to empty from the esophagus. We're not talking about a some sort of pseudoachalasia <coughs> from too tight a wrap, but did you let the barium go into the stomach? Do we have sort of a, a mini upper GI series at least? Do we have any evidence that barium did flow through the stomach into the duodenum or did we just uh, truncate, uh, truncate the barium swallow and, and stop at the esophagus? Do we have any data? Um, I'm not sure if we've got it on this slide, but it, it emptied from the esophagus into the stomach. But they, they did yeah. yeah they they didn't go any further than the esophagus to the stomach um, on that study. So we don't have a barium upper GI series per se. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, well, yeah. Before you, it's, yeah, obviously all roads might lead to a gastric emptying, but quite frankly, eventually you have to explain the anatomy or explain the results of the gastric emptying uh, if they are slow. So at some point you either have to do a, a, a full upper GI series or repeat the endoscopy. Uh, how many weeks are we post-op? I think this is about the six week mark. Yeah, well, that would be an option. She's not on narcotics, right? We've stopped pain meds. Correct. Yeah, well, that would be another issue. Narcotics could make uh, nausea complicated and uh, can cause a slow, slow gastric emptying. So, yeah, I mean, I go ahead. So Ryan. the other thing we have to consider is a dynamic video esophagram would be helpful because what you face with a recurrence is the hourglass effect where the actual stomach caught in the chest also faces a lot of impedance from the diaphragm constrictor. And you may have intermittent uh, volvulus that occurs with the food bolus. So I know you're an expert on motility, Richard. The video esophagram is underrated in real time to assess where the food's getting stuck in the recurrence. Okay. The take on the barium swallowed by the radiologist was that things looked fairly good. Is that it? Correct. And th this wasn't from our radiologist. This is from the country. All right. Yeah, I understand. So you know, I think Dr. Davis's point is well taken. I think it, even though we're tempted to you know, jump in on the stomach world here on this particular uh, you know, topic we're facing today, I think you know, starting at square one, I would still start at square one and do a good study of the uh, esophagus and the stomach probably radiographically before I jumped into something. Mm -hmm. Do you want to proceed, Henry? Yeah. All right. So um, this is a repeat CT, just still images demonstrating an intact um, repair. So she ended up being transferred down to St. Vincent's um, private hospital for ongoing admission. Um, mm -hmm. Given 
there are a few issues at play at the time we we're in the throes of the COVID lockdown Melbourne or metropolitan Melbourne was surrounded by what was dubbed the ring of steel it was very difficult to get in and out even if you um, were a patient needing um, uh, medical treatments or investigations so the decision was made to um, bring her in for inpatient investigation yeah um, she had a gastroscopy um, to start with that um, despite fasting, there was considerable food debris within the stomach. Um, it was beginning to look more and more like gastroparesis. Um, she then went on to have a gastric emptying study. Um, this was about two months post the operation at this point, um, which demonstrated marked gastroparesis. Only 50, she didn't reach a half emptying time at four hours. 50% of the meal was present at the study end. Um, these so are the maybe end. Maybe Richard can talk about the gastric emptying study and what his interpretation of that would be. So this was a, um, a standard um, egg meal, the uh, yes. typical egg beater meal. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks like um, obviously not much happened. Um, so Bezor, Bezor is always a concern. I, we've been burnt a few times where we, we go to surgery, of course, and we have a or do something else. And, you know, lo and behold, the stomach's full of a Bezor and the Bezor itself is is partially obstructive. So when they did the endoscopy and saw the bezoar or the food remaining, was it substantial food? Did they try to uh, put a rough net down or did they try to take the food out of the stomach? Did they try to clean the stomach before we did, before we did yes, the- so, so Richard, I, I did the endoscopy and it, the stomach was completely full. I didn't even try and remove anything. I aborted the procedure. And my plan was to come back for a repeat endoscopy after a prolonged fast and a liquid diet. Yeah. Yeah, well, these are the, these are the cases where, as you say, um, there's a bottleneck, nothing's leaving the pylorus. And the gastric emptying, yeah, you say it's slow, but it's, it's a combination of a, a roadblock in the stomach and probably vagal nerve damage. Mm. And that happened um, you know from the surgeries so yeah it's gastroparesis uh, complicated by a bezoar and um, hopefully not complicated by any pain meds or other issues well on, on that note oh, oh, we've got Ch dr chamara basnayaki in the panel as well now chamara's our gastroenterologist at st vincent's he's our functional gut expert and he's recently returned from fellowship in belgium and I think it was at this point that I actually referred this patient to Chamara on the ward. Um, as a surgeon, we've got very limited, I guess, experience in how to manage this effectively. And I needed to phone a friend, basically. So Chamara is my friend. Hello, Chamara. Thanks for including me, Matt. Can, can you hear me? I can. Loud okay, excellent. So, uh, I mean, in this patient's case, um, I mean, Matt, you sort of, adequately detected that gastroparesis was probably going to be at play. You did the gastric emptying study and, and then we had the diagnosis. Um, uh, as Henry pointed out, we were in a sort of a challenging public health situation and healthcare situation at the time. So this is a patient that had presented to a, a local regional hospital where there wasn't a lot of COVID and, and she she was getting dismissed from the emergency department because of her recurrent nausea. So we brought her into a, a city which did have a, a large amount of a public health problem with COVID. And we wanted to do as much as possible for her in one single admission um, without compromising um, her need to come back and forth between zones of high COVID and low COVID. So, I, I mean, we, we, as is the case with gastroparesis, I mean, this is, Ultimately, you just have to be quite pragmatic and, and you have to do what, what you have available to you. So as Richard made the point, um, painkillers can be a real issue in patients who present with sim upper GI symptoms and, and painkillers can certainly cause um, issues with gastric emptying. But fortunately, this patient wasn't on any. Um, in Australia, we have, have access to quite a lot of prokinetic medications that are not necessarily accessible in other parts of the world. Um, so we have access to domperidone, um, metoclopramide, erythromycin, procalipride. In this lady's case, we started very basic. We just 
um, asked her to go on a liquid diet. We had spaced meals. We had our dietitians in the hospital speak with her. Uh, we reduced the fat content of meals and the, the residue in the diet as well. And within about 48 hours of just simply metoclopramide, uh, 10 milligrams three times a day, and that diet, she had a significant improvement in her nausea. And, you, and in her case, how sorry, you, Richard, yep. How did you give the metoclopramide? So um, in the first 24 hours, it was intravenous, yeah. Um, and then we, then we gave her oral metoclopramide. Now, the reason why I didn't prescribe any other prokinetics in her case is her QT interval was elevated. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but in my mind, I didn't want to risk um, it was sort of a borderline QT interval. So I didn't want to give her any other prokinetics which could extend that QT interval and put her at risk of an arrhythmia. Yeah, one, um, but he, one, trick, one trick you may want to think about is subcutaneous Reglan. Reglan can be given subcutaneously by the patient and it guarantee, guarantees absorption. So uh, yeah. you, can't, you can't stay in the hospital forever getting IV metoclopramide. So we give the patient um, two, uh, two cc's, which is 10 milligrams, up to four times a day. I, I'm going to have to call you back, Lou up to four times a day sub Q. And this has bailed us out a lot. Uh, well, it's yeah. a temp temporary bailout. Uh, it's not gonna be a solution. When you have a bees or uh, the red flag is up there that you're going nowhere, but you can try, you can do a college try uh, and make yourself feel better, but uh, you're working against the tide. But uh, yeah. sub Q is a good trick. I've got many patients on it today who are diabetics, whose absorption of Reglan is unpredictable. They may be about to vomit, they go to the ER and it costs them a fortune. They can stay home, sub-Q Reglan's the same plasma level, the same plasma level within 20 minutes as IV. And yeah. very good trick, it's well tolerated. It's not approved in the PDR, it's sort of underground, but uh, yeah. we use it like water over here. Yeah. And uh, it's yeah. very, very effective. Uh, Richard, uh, uh, I think is... sorry, no, go ahead. No, I, this is Hiroshi from Boston. Uh, Richard, the, uh, to add to your thoughts also is the role potentially of PR and in the States, the newly FDA approved nasal spray. Yeah. Uh, it may be other routes that you could use with the same you know, medication. Yeah, he's talking about Chimoji, which is a nasal spray. Um, just approved and actually I'm using it um, with some special coupons. It's a bit expensive, but this is the same theory. Bypassing a um, gastroparotic stomach, a bezoar stomach, a patient who's so imminently about to vomit, the drug would just simply not be absorbed. And these are gonna be some interesting little scenarios that could, could buy you some time to get your drugs on board and stabilize in some cases the diabetic gastroparesis, the glucose out of control, pain meds are causing issues. It gives you some extra uh, wiggle room to play with the pharmacology. But um, yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, please go ahead. I think you, you, you're doing a good job, obviously, but that's just a, an interesting aside that we use uh, you know, when you're sort of getting desperate. No, thank you for that. I mean, I think that sounds actually like a, a useful um, strategy, especially for these patients in the community when, when you are, when you do have those concerns that you may not be absorbing the metoclopramide um, orally. Fortunately, in her case, um, you know, despite what is a grossly abnormal gastric emptying study, um, and her symptoms were just nausea, never vomiting. She never had any symptoms suggested of pain. And within 48 hours, her symptoms had almost completely resolved. Tomorrow, she's a, had the complication as well, so she may not vomit. Yeah, no, true, true. Um, but nevertheless, um, she had a very good symptomatic response with just very limited medical treatment and a, and a change from a dietary perspective. The issue for us obviously was um, then we converted it a tablet metoclopramide and, and there was some recurrence of a nausea, but we were, Matt and I were, I guess, debating 
do we then discharge this lady who is mostly symptomatically improved back to a hospital that's been dismissing her? Um, or do we just hit her with the kitchen sink to use an Australian phase phrase um, where we offer as many medical and surgical and endoscopic therapies as possible to mitigate any further hospital admissions? Uh, and anyway, Matt, do you want to comment on, on the pyloric uh, Botox yeah. and balloon dye? We've got another we slide. I don't know if we've got yeah, we pictures. The yeah. approach. We hit her with that kitchen sink. Um, as our kitchen sink doesn't include a gastric pacemaker or anything, but anyway, we took her back for that repeat endoscopy after that prolonged fast and liquid diet. We've got some images there showing, basically this, the, the top image shows the Z line from above, the geo junctions intact. So structurally the repair was good. And you can see the fundoplication just in that retroplex view. So everything was intact from a structural point of view. And on this occasion, the stomach was empty and I elected to inject the pylorus with some Botox at this setting. And at the same time, I did a, a, a stretch. So I injected the 100 units and I did sort of four quadrant injections and I flushed the line and inject another four times. And that, that, that was the pylorus post dilatation. So it's probably controversial what I did, but um, I don't know, Hiroshi, Richard, yeah. what do you think? Um, no, I think, you know, you as you said, this is a patient going back to probably a small country town and you're trying to give her a jump start and um, 200 units. I'll probably given 200 units of Botox in the pylorus. I think what we're doing today is we're doing endoflip. You know, we would do endoflip uh, in the beginning and say, <coughs> how, how resistant, how tight is this pylorus? It's like a collision now. We're not just doing. Um, poem or pneumatics or surgery, we're, we're doing a baseline endoflip study to understand the resistance and the pressure. And then we're doing this. Um, it could be the Botox, it could be um, G poem, it could be a surgical pyroplasty, etc. But I think you getting a baseline is important because by definition, you know, a post phagotomy pyloris does not relax very well. And uh, we assume we'd find very dramatic what's called end of flip data. Are, are you guys down there in the Melbourne and other places uh, getting some end of flip action yet? Uh, what, what's your uh, vision? No, uh, no. So no, we no. don't have end of flip, and and there's no. It's it's end of flip is is costly, and there's no remuneration from the government for end of flip. So at this right. point in time, I don't. I'm not aware of anyone with end of flip. Okay. Um, can I make a comment? Can I make a comment that th that this girl is only two months post op, and you mm -hmm. may not have divided her vagus, but you may have stretched it, and mm -hmm. there's a good chance that she's going to recover some of her vagal function, and so I think doing the Botox will buy her some time. We've been doing Botox uh, at the time of our MIS esophagectomies, um, injecting right in the OR. Uh, and that gets them through the first six or eight weeks and hopefully improves their gastric tube emptying. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is Roshi. Just, just, to this, just to take this comment forward, as Philip says, uh, it's still eight weeks is uh, not much. Uh, and uh, I have had over the last 20 years, few patients. Uh, I would just wait uh, beyond you know, three months at least. Uh, and uh, uh, it's probably neuropraxia. Secondly, it's very, very unusual for, even as a second operation, for, as an upper GA surgeon, even experienced to divide both vaguses. So even if you have divided one vagus still, there's another part of the vagus, uh, you know, it still could sort of, uh, there's a reversible functionality. So, uh, you know, uh, at this stage, uh, uh, you know, uh, no, no further invasive intervention is necessary, uh, given where she is from. I think dilatation or with, with, with Botox is, is, is fine, but I would not call it as neurectomy at this stage. I would call probably as a neuroproxia and then wait and watch in the coming weeks. Uh, this is Hiroshi, my input I'm on this. Neuropraxia, yeah, go ahead, yes. Hiroshi. So I fully agree that, you know, sometimes watchful waiting is helpful, uh, particularly within, let's say, two, three months of operation. Uh, that said, by the time you see large, you know, bezoars or residual solid 
uh, we have to be remind, uh, minded of what the physiology of the stomach is. That is, it handles uh, liquids very differently from solids. And when you see such non-triturated food, then that the terminal uh, antrum is the crushing part of the stomach. And that is what's dysfunctional. So going back to my initial comment much earlier when I was talking about an educator or, or thorough exam of the antrum, uh, although when I made that comment it was in a difficult time when it was still in volvulus. But when we look at this, we have to take our time to really look at this antrum as well as the pylorus to see what it's like. As far as Botox, as you may know, the person who popularized this, uh, Jay Pasricha, uh, had a meta-analysis in this group had shown that this is actually not helpful in gastroparesis and AMS took the, uh, the stance that it should not be used routinely only by research. And why this is, I believe, is that there is still going to be a subset of patients that will benefit and uh, Richard McCallum's point is well taken that we need to understand the physiology of fear much better to find out who would. And we just don't do that because we just look at gastric emptying, which is not a, a reasonable output for this. Yeah, I think so, that... Yes, so what I had made the comment earlier was looking at the incisura for a good way and looking to see whether the pylorus is uh, blatantly patent or not. And by plate patent, remember that the pylorus, the passage in the uh, trap position is at two millimeters. It has the position of sitting at two millimeters. So when you're seeing something clamped down greater than that with no movement, but with no, uh, then that might be an argument to relaxing. But at the same time, when there's no incisural wave, which I suspect is what's going on here and no antral wave going on, then the, the actual enhancement of motility that would occur is minimal. So again, no literature to support what I'm saying, but I, I'm, I'm, what I am supporting is a better definition of subpopulation of that, that which may um, uh, benefit from both apps. Yeah, well, that's where, that's where the end of flip comes in. We think that diabetics and empathics have not been that responsive. Dr. Parkman did a double blind trial uh, that was negative, but we've all found that a subset, mainly post that subset, uh, can respond uh, in some cases to, to Botox. Uh, unfortunately, in this country, it's become, you know, people bill for these things and Botox is sort of sexy and, you know, I'm doing something, you know, nurse hand me a vial, I'm going to do something. You've got to be very careful. You're not fooling yourself. You, it, we call it, you're probably kissing your sister. Uh, this, is not, this is not a passion treatment. Uh, you, you're going through the action. And that's okay, but let's be honest. Uh, basically, she'll be back. Uh, but it's not a bad way to get her home for a few weeks. But there's no data here uh, that would support a long-term outcome. Exactly. So Richard, what, yeah. what, what's your standard algorithm in this situation then? Uh, our standard algorithm in this, well, we, we'd go longer. I mean, we'd agree four weeks, eight weeks, whatever it is. It's early. And maybe I'll ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Davis to make a comment. He and I work together. He can probably predict what I'm going to say. But uh, what do you think we would do together when we saw this patient? Well, I think, like you all mentioned, neuropraxy is your first diagnosis, especially because they improve with liquids, so there's not dysphagia to liquids. You know, I do think in this case, we should seriously look at G-POEM as the best next option for post-surgical uh, vagotomy problems with gastroparesis because it's less invasive and it produces pretty quick outcomes results. But not many people are doing it yet and not many people are skilled at it. Which, we, do, you, do you mean G poems less invasive than, polar, than the Botox? Or? No, I think you need a long-term functional outcome with the channel. And if you're looking for a billable procedure in the United States, we have two or three experts per state now uh, in major centers becoming confident with this and it's low risk and results in very few complications. Matthew, what was the outcome of the treatment that you gave the Botox and the dilatation? Oh, good question, Christopher. Henry, do you want to put, put the next slide up? Uh, sure. So uh, some of this um, uh, Dr. Lazanaki talked about, but essentially she had a reasonably good outcome. Um, she was um, 
with some medical therapy as well. She was on regular metoclopramide, but couldn't have any other prokinetic to do her QT segment as discussed. Um, she had input from a dietitian. She had some dietary modifications, but um, within a relatively short period of time, she um, she returned to a normal diet of three meals a day. She started gaining weight again. In her words, she felt like a new woman. I took that from your letter, Dr. Basanaki. Um, there was a minor... There was a period where she, she did have sort of a lapse or a relapse in her symptoms, um, namely nausea. Um, however, on digging, she'd really kind of, um, she was no longer compliant with, with her treatment diet. Um, but, you know, on, on re-education and um, I, I guess resume, resumption of the, of, the, of the liquid diet, small meals six times a day, the gastroparetic diet, uh, this settled down. Um, she was able to wean her prokinetics um, over a period of time and is now doing very well and is due for a clinical review in February 2021. So she's had, she's had multiple um, you know, treatments, both endoscopic and medical and lifestyle, um, all of which will, will have had some, made some contribution. Um, to right. exactly so what was I think in this case, we've, we've managed to achieve a, an optimal outcome, but I think it highlights the, the importance of a multidisciplinary team approach. So as a surgeon, you know, you can fix a hernia, but when these functional out sort of issues arise, you really need a team approach. And I was just fortunate to have a, you know, a good team member alongside me because Chamar was really responsible for dealing with a lot of those long-term issues and, and liaising with her when she was back home in the country. Um, so I think I, I can't highlight that point enough. Matt, to dovetail that, emphasis on multidisciplinary approach, the other importance that Jamara provided was a separate emotionally disconnected approach. So as a surgeon, we're so emotionally invested, we want to fix the patients, we want to make sure that they're you know perfect at every moment. And yeah. so it's nice having someone who's, who's emotionally divested to be able to step in and say, look, it's time to you know pump the brakes, try a couple of non-invasive maneuvers and uh, you know let things ride for a bit. And as, as she demonstrated, a tincture of time was probably the most wise treatment for her. Hmm. Yeah, very true. Very true that. And Chamara is good at that. I've realized he, he's <laughs> not going to go, he'll go slow. <laughs> so, uh, so if I, I can I make a few want... comments. Oh, sorry. No, no, Roshi, no, if I can also just uh, um, e echo your sentiment about this lady. So, I mean, you know, we were aware that the randomized control trials in Botox are essentially negative. Um, I mean, this lady, the, there's a slight behavioral and psychological component to, to why she was presenting to hospitals. So she was very anxious um, and that was, that was playing a role in, in this. And, and that was, I mean, the three or four presentations to hospital. And then we thought we would just hit the kitchen sink. We would just provide what we could in one admission with our fingers crossed that, that this may both one give her the sense that we've done a lot for her, reassure her, um, and, and, and hope that that would sort of bridge her until, um, as everyone has already mentioned, with six to eight weeks after the operation, she would most likely feel significantly better. I, I sort of make a comment here that she, she developed a bit of akathisia on the metoclopramide and I converted her to domperidone, which she tolerated for a short period of time. And then ultimately, um, the anxiety actually was probably one of the key issues. And this is something that as a, I suppose as surgeons, you don't necessarily have to deal with and, and you can leave it to maybe us as the gastroenterologists or maybe some of our psychologist, psychology colleagues on our teams to, to sort of help with. But this lady was just generally highly anxious and the fact that she was essentially mismanaged and yeah. um, in her local hospital and dismissed frequently I played a, a sort of a big role in, in sort of, I guess, um, mistrust of how, what her symptoms meant and what doctors were doing with them. And anyway, so, so addressing that actually made a big difference. And I suppose that also emphasizes um, um, some of the other points that were made that, you know, as a di emotionally divested member of the team, we're able to kind of take a slightly different stance and, and, and help these patients. Yeah, well, I think I think you know many of my patients are taking tricyclics. That's part of the pro, part of the anxiety. But whether it's trust in doctors or bad experiences, the other aspect you have to look for in very anxious and uh, 
uh, stressed type of patients is a condition called rumination syndrome. Patients who vomit within 15 to 30 minutes of eating, that's not gastroparesis, it doesn't happen. That's a condition called rumination syndrome. The ability to bring food and liquids relatively undigested up within 15 to 30 minutes. And this is a, a spectrum of gastroparesis related to stress. So some patients can come in and say, gee, doctor, I'm not doing well. And you say, well, what's the problem, Mrs. Jones? Well, doctor, you know, I eat and I bring it up almost before I, you know, I leave the table. I have to go to the trash can and vomit. That's not gastroparesis. That's rumination related to anxiety and stress. And you need to be very careful uh, that you separate that. That, that. that occurs with a normal stomach gastric emptying, can occur with a slow gastric emptying. That needs to be separated from true gastroparetic vomiting, which is hours, hours after the meal. But many of these patients need to be on tricyclics. Uh, some need to be on Cymbalta or an SSIR uh, for degrees of abdominal discomfort and or sort of psychological fragility. Yeah, it's a team effort. And, um, and you need to sort of sustain, um, sustain that part. I mean, we know that in idiopathic gastroparesis, 50% of the patients, they're 90% women, 50% have had physical and sexual abuse. And so that's in their background. And that plays a role into the way they tolerate pain and the way they tolerate symptoms. So, so this does take uh, a lot of work. That's why, you know, surgery is fine, but it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the total patient care involves digging into a lot of areas and, and getting totally immersed in the whole patient. And uh, that's when you get the best result as uh, I think your team has demonstrated. Uh, gastroparesis is why it's not that popular among GI fellows. It's not just scope them and go home and good luck, Mrs. Jones. Gastroparesis is a, is a commitment. It's a continuous follow-up and a total involvement uh, with the patient. And, uh, and Dr. Davis and I, having a surgeon like him and myself, we've learned that, uh, that this is, uh, this is a commitment that goes well beyond the usual GI stuff where you just, uh, you know, treat the Barrett's or take a biopsy or put them on some other treatment. This is a, a huge commitment uh, to address many aspects of the patient. Surgery is the cure. Uh, <laughs> yes, the point I, I'd like to raise though uh, here, and I think it's being already said, is that gastric motility does not correlate to most of the endpoints that we get concerned about in terms of symptoms. And many of us who endoscope find out that we have tons of broccoli or whatnot, enough to even try to evacuate by, you know, uh, the, you know as if we're doing foreign body extractions uh, and that the patient wasn't complaining as much. So on the other hand, we see a lot of complainers with nausea who, who don't, you know, who have normal gastric emptying also. So gastric emptying itself as a measure does not correlate particularly to things such as abdominal pain or, or, or nausea, maybe vomiting, but um, uh, dyspepsia certainly. And that brings us to the point, what were we treating here in this patient? Obviously time healed things, so we don't know if you know, Botox had an effect or not. But if this were primarily nausea, it does stand to reason why the dopaminergics were helpful and that we didn't really need strong prokinetics necessarily. That said, if we did, then the newer generation of 5-HT4, which are the prokinetics, remember 5-HT4 prokinetics and 5-HT3 uh, being the um, more pain uh, addressing. So uh, the new 5-HT4s that are purer, uh, such as let's say the Lucitrag, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the Lucitrag, uh, may have uh, you know, a better prokinetic uh, effect uh, by uh, and, and less of a QT or cardiac uh, effect. So I think there's hope on the you know, horizon that we have a better pharmacology to discern between the 5 hp 4 um, uh, uh, effects versus 5 hp 3 effects. And there is also hope for better uh, dopaminergic effects. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the NIH data, 
uh, the most common symptom is early satiety and nausea. And 90, 95% of people have it. Vomiting maybe may drop down to 50. I think the platform of a centrally acting antiemetic and a peripherally acting prokinetic, the domperidone model, and there's a new domperidone coming from Takeda with no QT issues. I think that's the best model. Uh, hitting central nausea and peripheral prokinetic. I think it's a great model. Uh, I, I don't think until further proven that 5-HT4s alone uh, will we'll be, uh, be able to address that issue as well. I, I like, I like the, the combination platform. I think it, it makes great sense uh, in the reality of these patients. You treat the nausea and the patient feels better by Friday night. If you give a prokinetic, it takes two weeks to digitalize your stomach and wake it up. Uh, I want to feel better by Friday. Uh, Antiemetics make me feel better by Friday. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a very important point. From a pharmacology point of view, uh, it seems that, you know, uh, while dirty drugs like metoclopramide had various effects, both dopaminergic and serotonergic, as well as cholinergic, um, the, uh, the newer drugs such as the, let's say the, the Belucetrag, uh, being cured did decrease some of the, you know, untoward uh, effects of the uh, five, prior 5-HD4s. Uh, the TAC-906 that uh, Dr. McCallum is uh, talking about is also kind of a combined D1, D2. Uh, and so I, I would suspect that some of the, maybe the return to, you know, kind of multi-pronged uh, uh, meds uh, may have a better effect uh, just as you know, we would like medical uh, And so maybe there will be a return to having pure drugs and combination of pure drugs, which is one way, or again, safer uh, multi-pronged uh, single drugs. Thank you, Hiroshi. I've just been going through the comments and I just missed one from Jenny Myers. Now, um, Christopher spoke about David Watson before. Jenny used to be David's um, scientist, did all of the physiology. Right. And she just raised a point that could we potentially have had a false positive with the nuclear med study if it was sitting on top of a food bolus um, in the stomach? So I guess I, from memory, I think we had at least a two day fast after the gastroscopy before the nuclear med scan. But um, any well, comments about that, having false positives in... in um, with those gastric emptying studies? Well, there was virtually no em emptying in four hours. Your study went up to 240 minutes, didn't it, in the, in the slide that, uh, that Henry showed. So very delayed uh, emptying. And if it was sitting on top of food already in the stomach, well, the, st the food was there for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Was she in hospital at that time? Was it How many days post-op was this uh, original gastric emptying? Uh, it was around the six week mark post the, the redo surgery. It was about two days after the first gastroscopy, which I aborted. I see. So she was definitely off narcotics, right? Because that's, that's the major cause of Bezoar in the world is narcotics. Uh, was she off narcotics? Definitely. Can you say definitely, Chamara? Yeah, definitely. She wasn't on any narcotics. She wasn't, no. Yeah, that's a major player in transient or reversible gastroparesis is patients who are still taking narcotics or surreptitiously taking narcotics from another doctor. And uh, that's, that's a major player in uh, trying to resolve um, some of these unexplained findings. What's the latest gastric emptying show? Is the latest gastric? We, we 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 haven't we haven't repeated it, and, and truthfully, I, I don't I don't have any intention to because she's uh, symptomatically cured. Um, Most patients like to know, doctor, is my stomach really better? I don't think I don't see any reason not to do another gastric empty. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, yeah, I, she's happy at the moment, but I mean, I, we might discuss that at the next appointment. I, I just in terms of um, Jenny's question, um, I mean, I think it just given the whole story, the the the, the surgical background, the symptoms, the gastroscopy finding. I, I think the problem, and and in fact, the very severe delayed gastric emptying. 
um, it most probably is a, a true positive, putting everything together. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I, I also want to sort of reiterate Hiroshi's point earlier that that um, the severity of, of these emptying studies do not correlate very well with symptoms. It's really important to remember. There's, there's no severe gastric emptying, um, sorry, a severely delayed gastric emptying uh, does not necessarily correlate at all with the severity of the symptoms of the patient. And we've also got Walter online, who's, um, I don't know, have you got sound there, Walter, or do you want me to read out your question? Oh, I can, I, I can turn on. Oh. Hi, Walter. Yeah. Walter's from Harvard. I guess one question I have kind of related to whether the symptoms correlate with gastric emptying is um, <clears throat> when is the onset of her symptoms or worsening of her symptoms that's related to her eating or her meals? Because a lot of times if, if, if she says that, you know, nausea get, uh, happens or get worse within 10 to 15 minutes of eating, it's probably not related to whatever delay emptying that we see on the gastric emptying scan. It might be more related to a uh, you know, visceral hypersensitivity of some sort um, that where a neuromodulator like a TCA might work better in treating the symptoms. Uh, and um, corollary sorry. to that, Walter, is that um, sometimes we can see uh, a kind of dichotomy where we see even in the overt evidence of uh, these ors or whatnot, that with the loss of fundic uh, accommodation, uh, there's uh, the possibility of actually enhanced liquid emptying, which we don't do a good job measuring. We don't discern the two. So uh, in that uh, setting, uh, you know, kind of uh, high rich nutrients with sugars, et cetera, can give you a different reason for nausea uh, that, you know, should be addressed. So clearly when we jump to the gun by saying, oh gosh, there's a lot of broccoli in here. This is delayed gastric end of story may not be appreciating the possibility there is also, and this is particularly so for early diabetic gastroparesis, um, that there may be uh, fast liquid emptying. Yeah, if you look at the data, but food in the stomach is not a marker of gastroparesis. Look at the studies that they've published recently. Uh, finding food in the stomach tomorrow morning when I do an endoscopy, and I do a gastric emptying the next week, they will not correlate. So, you know, the, the, but the food in the stomach is a blockage to the pylorus. So it's not clear really whether there ever was true gastroparesis. I mean, you could easily argue that this patient was eating late at night or had too much to eat and the food is blocking the gastric emptying egg, egg meal, but yet it's not true gastroparesis and the pyloric response is interesting because there's no correlation between food in the stomach today and a gastric emptying next week. That's pretty well shown. So you can't hang your hat on food in the stomach as being a uh, marker for gastroparesis. It's not. Thank you. Well, I think we're drawing to a conclusion. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for all their um, comments. I think it's been a great discussion and. I think uh, I, I didn't plan it this way, but the case seemed to have a lot for the surgeons and a lot for the gastroenterologists. So thank you all for participating. Are there any final questions? Matthew, Chris, Chris Stoddard. Um, the problem that this lady had, I suspect, with her initial operation is that it was done by a surgeon, a jobbing surgeon, who'd heard about laparoscopic fundoplications and whatever, and he clearly would not have nowhere near the experience of doing the operation that you and your unit have. He maybe does two or three a year. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I would say that the likelihood was that this lady had a poor operation because it was done by an operation who, uh, by a surgeon who did relatively few low volume and the low volume work he's not as experienced his outcomes are not going to be as good we know that for all branches of surgery whether it be fundoplication esophagectomy colonic resections rectal excisions right. vol volume that is important and perhaps right. the main message from this is that the first operation, if it had been done by someone doing it frequently, would probably have been a good operation with good control 
and you would not have had all of the problems that we've been discussing for the last 90 minutes. Um, the the uh, video that you showed, and the dis discussion we had at the time, that lady's esophageal hiatus didn't seem to have been dissected. The sutures that you found were in the wrong place. And I think that is the basic problem with this case. Operations, fund applications, anti-reflux operations, particularly for large hiatus hernias, can be difficult. They need to be done by surgeons who have good experience. Yeah. And Matt, to dovetail that thought, which I think is spot on, um, is a sensitive conversation that I have with the referring surgeons. Um, I first off let them know that the patient's doing well, appreciate their referral, give them my cell phone number and let them know that I'm always here to help yeah. them. And yeah. to think of us when they run into this type of circumstance in the future and get the patient over to us, we'd be more than happy to help out. Yes. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, you need to be approachable and just there to help out these uh, peripheral surgeons. But um, and it's a sensitive topic and quite a political one. You know, you're yeah. talking about volume and centralization. I know you went down that pathway in the UK with the cancer work. Yes. Um, but uh, we're a long way off that in Australia. So, <laughs> but I think I think that is the key. Yeah. All right. I think Robert, did you want to make a comment? Are you still there? Well, uh, I heard all this with the greatest interest, and it was. Uh, and a passionating case, if I may say so. Uh, we heard about the rotation of the vulvulus, about gastroparesis, about physiology, and at the end, about the beautiful discussion with uh, Richard and uh, our gastroenterologist about prokinetics, about uh, the uh, various aspects, physiological aspects of this deep, uh, type of, uh, of disease and the conclusion that was given about the importance of the experience at the time of the first operation to avoid such uh, outcomes was uh, of the greatest interest. It was an undoubtedly a multidisciplinary discussion thanks to the level of the speakers that contributed. And I should say that uh, born out of the tragedy of this world pandemic, the new method we are experiencing in ERZO, that is discussions of clinical cases proposed by the pilot centers of the platform, seems to be, I should say, a, an educational suitable alternative to the ERZO congresses, numbering 15 up until last year. And indeed, I can tell you that our platform of excellence in esophagology is currently taking shape for future years to come. And it is built on ESO's past achievements, applying the latest state-of-the-art technologies. And it aims to put forward a tremendous tool of multidisciplinary education to the international scientific community. This is our goal, this is our aim, and we shall, shall keep all of you here today, as well as all the corresponding members of ESO informed of the various stages in its development. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your team. Thank you for the kind of beautiful organization of this panel. And uh, we're very proud of having your team among those of the pilot platform in the, in the platform of excellence of the Stanford Sempire Excellence. Thank you for your organization. Yeah, Matthew, you. Matthew, very nice job. Uh, the only question I have now is, can you get me Australian open tickets so I can come <laughs> down and uh, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy some real tennis? Yeah, they're playing in front of crowds now. <laughs> I remember your call, Richard, one night in the middle of the night a few years ago. I remember it very well. <laughs> Rich Open got some culture, but Melbourne's, yes. Melbourne's different culture. So uh, I'll have to watch it at midnight on TV and terrorize my wife, but uh, uh, there's going to be some good stuff down there. Hmm. We, we, we're very close to the tennis center. We can see it from our hospital, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Now, uh, it was a real pleasure to have you on the screen today, Richard. <laughs> yeah, I'm Thank glad you, Richard. 
glad to be actually with Dr. Davis, my colleague with me, Robert, has not really uh, appreciated the, the uh, Uzo world much, but we, we may talk about making Texas Tech another another center or another satellite uh, over here. Dr. Davis does all the endoscopic and uh, surgical fundos and does all the procedures and would be a great asset. And I think we might talk to you about uh, elevating the game here in, in El Paso and uh, maybe starting a little bit of a uh, Uzo collaboration. It, you will be welcome, Richard. You know that very well. And we've also got Keith Dindy online. Keith, Keith is from the Tenwick Hospital, works with Russell White. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I need to have a word with Keith because Keith is going to be our fellow at St. Vincent's. Uh -huh. That's important. Well, we're organizing a, a fellowship for Keith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lovely. Know? I really enjoyed it, the discussion today. Hello, Keith. It will be very important, um, uh, Matthew, because we'll speak about the organization in the month to come of uh, fellowships and the uh, um, presence of trainers and uh, in, in various from the various pilot centers to other pilot centers of the platform. And I will certainly call you and uh, have a conversation on this uh, subject with you and with Russell White as well. Okay. Happy to have a chat. Mm. <clears throat> so, Keith, are you able to stay on for a bit of a talk? Can we use this forum just for a yep. few extra minutes? Oh, no. Yes, fantastic. All right, that's good. Huh? Yeah. I think that's it. I'd like, yeah, thanks again to everyone who's still there. Thanks. Good job, man. Good job. Bye -bye. Thank you, Kevin, thanks for stepping in. Bye-bye, Richard. Bye -bye. Thanks Bye -bye. for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 B